Hey, this is Nikki from One Life, and this is our student experience. This week, we're going to be tackling the topic, God and the law. So speaking of the law, Kentucky, where I'm from, is full of really random and obscure laws that are still on the books for some reason or another. Um, and just one city over in Owensboro, Kentucky, one of the laws that's still on the books is that a married woman cannot buy a hat without her husband's permission. I don't know if anyone has been fined for that recently or not, um, but I'm curious, what are some obscure laws from your area? Or even if you're in Kentucky, look up random laws um, from Kentucky and share those out on social media. They can be really interesting. So last week we tackled the big question, who is God? And if you missed that, I would encourage you to go check that video out on our YouTube channel. This week's question is, what is justification? So it's a word that we throw around a lot, justifying things or the justification for something. But what does it really mean? We're gonna watch a quick Bible project video um, about the law or the Torah to kind of dive deeper into this subject. You're most likely familiar with the Ten Commandments in the Bible, stuff we generally take as good advice. Don't murder, don't steal, honor your parents, the list goes on. And those are just the first ten. There are actually a total of 613 commands, all given to ancient Israel, found in the first five books of the Bible, which in Hebrew are called the Torah. Now the word Torah is usually translated in English as the law, because it has all of these laws in it. And as you read through them, you wonder, Am I supposed to obey some of these, all of these? I mean, what's the purpose of the law? Well, that translation is kind of confusing because while the Torah has laws in it, the book itself is fundamentally a story about how God is creating new kinds of people who are fully able to love God and love others. And when Jesus taught about the Torah, he said that he was bringing that story to its fulfillment. So walk me through the story and how it's fulfilled. So the story begins with God creating humanity who rebels. And God chooses Abraham to bless all of the nations through his family, who end up in slavery down in Egypt, and so God rescues them. Then at Mount Sinai, God makes a covenant with Israel, like an agreement. And all of the laws that Moses gives to Israel are the terms of that agreement. They're like a constitution. And so some of the laws, they're about rituals and customs that set Israel apart from the nations. Other laws are about social justice or morality. And by following these, Israel would show the other nations what God is like. Okay, so the rest of the Torah is just the complete list of laws that Moses gives Israel? Mm, no, the rest of the Torah just continues the story. And the 613 commands are only a selection from that original constitution. And even these have been broken up and placed at strategic points within the story. Now pay attention because you'll see a really clear pattern. Moses gives the first laws to Israel. Yeah, don't worship other gods, don't make idols. And then right after that, there's a story of Israel breaking those very laws. Yeah, they worship the golden calf. And so Moses gives some more laws and then you get more stories of rebellion. Some more laws, rebellion again, some more laws, more rebellion, and you start to see the point. Right, no matter how many laws, they're just gonna continue to rebel. So at the conclusion of the Torah's story, Moses gives this final speech to Israel as they prepare to go into their new home. And he tells them, you guys, I know that you're not going to follow all of God's laws. You've proven to me that you're incapable. And Moses says the problem is that their hearts are hard and that they're going to need new transformed hearts if they're ever going to truly follow God's law. And he was right. I mean, the story goes on to recount Israel's total failure. They go into the land, they break all the laws. Right. Now, the next section of books in the Jewish tradition are the 15 books of the prophets, and they reflect back on the story. For example, Ezekiel, he said that if Israel was ever going to obey the law, God's spirit would have to transform their hard hearts into soft hearts. And Jeremiah said that's when obedience to God's commands wouldn't feel like a duty, but they would be written deep in their hearts. And Isaiah, he promised a future leader, Israel's Messiah, who will lead all of the people in obedience to the law. Now in Jewish tradition, all of these books together are called the prophets, even the historical books, because they're continuing the story told from the perspective of the prophets. Okay, so we have the law and the prophets, and they're telling one connected story about God's desire to bless the whole world through a people, Israel, who it turns out needs a new heart. Yes, and Jesus saw himself as continuing that 
story. So he agreed with the law and the prophets when he taught that it's out of the human heart that come the most ugly parts of human nature. It's like the default setting of our hearts is opposed to God's law. But Jesus also said that he came to solve that problem and in his words, to fulfill the law. So what does he mean there to fulfill the law? Well, first he said that the demand of all of the laws in the Torah could be fulfilled by what he called the great command, that we are to love God and to love others. So that seems pretty easy. I mean, we all want to love. Well, we think we want to love. But Jesus showed how love is far more demanding than we realize. So he quotes the law, do not murder. And he says, yes, not killing someone is a very loving thing to do. But then he also says that when you treat someone with disrespect or when you nurse resentment against them, you're also violating God's moral ideal because you're not treating that person with love. And so Jesus said true love ought to extend even to our own enemies. So even though this command seems very simple, Jesus showed how our hearts are not currently equipped to fulfill even this basic command of God to love others. And that's kind of a downer. But where Israel failed, Jesus brought this story to its fulfillment. As Israel's Messiah, he fully loved God and others. And he showed all of the nations what God is truly like. He did this through his acts of compassion and mercy and ultimately by loving his enemies even unto death. And after his resurrection, he told his followers that he would send God's spirit to transform their hearts so that they could follow him and fulfill the purpose of the law, to love God and to love their neighbor. So this fulfills the story of the law and the prophets, or in the words of the Apostle Paul, the one who loves fulfills the law. So in the video, it talks about um, the Torah um, or the laws that were handed down from God. And there's this clear theme throughout that story of these laws being handed down from God and humanity failing to follow the laws over and over again. We're handed laws and we fail to follow them. This is creating this um, dialogue of like, why is this happening? And ultimately, we're told that it's because we have hard, hearts. And so a change of heart has to take place to where following the law is no longer a duty, but something that we desire to do. Ultimately, Jesus comes and fulfills the law in so that he can send the Holy Spirit to finally, once and for all, get rid of our hardened hearts and give us soft hearts that are able to follow God's law. Here in just a moment, there's going to be some questions on your screen to help you process through that video again. So we are going to look into scripture now to look more into um, justification and God's role in that. And so we are going to be in the book of Luke chapter 4 verses 16 through 21. I am reading from the NIV version of the Bible. So in verse 16 it says, He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So today this would be a complete mic drop moment. Jesus reads this scripture, this prophecy that everyone in the synagogue is so familiar with. And he says, today this is fulfilled. This is me. I am the promised one in this prophecy here. And so it's no um, coincidence that Jesus kicks off his ministry in this moment. He comes in and he makes this bold proclamation and he knows that it's going to get people talking and people are either going to be completely um, 
want completely um, believing in this and they are going to want to follow him or they are going to ridicule him and they're going to turn away from this and he knows that full well and he still makes this proclamation that this prophecy is about him and it's really going to kick his ministry off so that people start talking about him in that moment. And we're still going to be in the book of Luke, but we're going to go over into Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 4. And it says this. This is the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. It says, To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Man, how many times have you prayed the prayer of the Pharisee? I know I have. We justify ourselves so often by comparing ourselves to others that we feel like are more sinful than us. But this scripture tells us very clearly that the one who admitted his sinfulness is the one that is justified by God. Because only when we actually admit that we are sinners and in need of God's grace can we truly be justified and accept that. In just a moment, some questions are going to come up on your screen and you'll be able to read back through these two passages of scripture and process through them with these questions. So this week's question was, what is justification? The answer to that question, justification is the gracious act of God where he declares believers not guilty, but in right standing with him because of Jesus. The Torah or the law was made up of 631 different laws, but ultimately it was summed up in this, that we should love God and love others. That was the whole summation of the law. And it's been said that justification can be summed up by the phrase, just as if. So because Jesus loved perfectly and died for our sins, we are able to have a relationship with God just as if we never sinned. So that is what justification looks like with God. Here in just a moment, there are going to be some application questions for you to be able to process through this teaching throughout the week and apply it into your world and apply it to your life. So I hope you'll take a moment to go through those and even come back to them throughout the week. I'm so glad that you were with us today. And as always, keep seeking and keep searching. We'll see you next week.